there. Let's talk sports fans. I'm excited to be joined again by Dan uh, to talk a little Mets. How you doing? I'm doing great, Dan, and how are you? It's uh, closer to baseball season now, so I'm looking forward to it. And uh, I just want to make sure that uh, um, we're having a good time and uh, we're just enjoying the time here. And uh, I appreciate the opportunity to be on your, your show. Thank you very much. Now, thanks for coming along. I very much enjoyed last time. Um, and... Um, I hope the family's safe and doing well. We're all doing great. And um, uh, it's just waiting for the spring. But as I said to you a little while ago, up here where I live, uh, up in uh, near the Albany area, it might snow tomorrow. So, <laughs> But baseball season is here, so we're ready to go, baby. Yeah. And um, before we get started, there's a couple of announcements in... Um, I'm happy to announce we're being sponsored with this monthly show by a basketball academy called Rob Blackwell, who uh, specialises in helping develop uh, young uh, basketball players to get them ready for college. So they're doing very good work and if anyone's interested, I will put a link in the description below. Um, other than that, um, I'm happy. I actually told you this, Dan. You may have seen it on, uh, when I shared it, but I got approached by a um, st sports streaming service called uh, Northwest Streaming Service. And... They're going to be putting our content on their platform and it'll reach more people. Well, that's that's really good. And to the basketball camp and the coaches there for the boys, um, no doubt they're going to make a big difference in these kids' lives in, in good ways, in small ways, and big ways. And, uh, you know, to compete and to learn and to have teammates and work with some friends that, and these guys will develop friendships that might last a lifetime. So whoever they are and working out with these young kids, uh, it's a wonderful opportunity to, for them to, to do that. So kudos to them. Yeah, I agree. I mean, that's really um, sort of a rewarding thing. Obviously, you're doing sport, which is what you love, but you're also um, helping build these young men and women up and i would imagine that's very rewarding in itself well, good 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 that's very good yep um other than that um if we get the ball rolling have you found the mets pre-season i've pretty much found it as you would expect there hasn't been any horror injuries and um, I don't put too much stock in the preseason other than it's a good way to get a bit of chemistry. Yeah, I, I agree. I, I think this is the first time in 12 years that I haven't been down to the Mets spring training. Uh, but um, I think the preseason was very good. Um, I think Alonzo, from looking at some of the games on TV, uh, is, is a little bit more disciplined on his approach to the plate now. And he went to the opposite field a couple of times. So I think I think the confidence level from the hurry burry of last year and coming off a wonderful rookie season with those home runs and everything. So I, I think that's great. Um, you, you'll look at some of the other players that were, were just starting to place. You got Lindor and, and, and McNeil you know, in the middle. And you have some bench players. Uh, Gilmore, Villar, and Pilar playing, and, and I think that's going to be a major impact. Uh, how these guys looked in spring training, the different positions that they did. The only bad stuff is the down injuries to Lugo and Carrasso. Uh, they come back in late May, hopefully, or mid of May. Uh, and then you got um, uh, our buddy, uh, Mr. Syndergaard, coming back sometime in, in uh, June. 
And that's to me is like um, a, a, a real good trade where you're not trading any plays, but you're getting some quality plays. I think the only downside to this um, is is the catching behind McCann. Uh, Nieto, he's um, you know good be, behind the plate defensively. Uh, if something does happen to McCann, uh, that's going to be a problem. You got Caleb Joseph on the taxi squad. Uh, my thing was this is armchair quarterbacking right now. But, boy, the Mets could have used Jason Castro. Um, he's not going to hit for average, but he's in the major leagues for a while. He came up with the Houston Astros. He's back with the Astros now. But that would have been a good bat as a secondary to McCann, plus he's left-handed bat. But uh, the team will hit. The team's going to really, really hit. Um, I think they'll do well with uh, DeGrom and, and, and uh, Stroman um, as the leader. Hopefully, uh, Peterson and uh, Lucchese will will fill the bill a little bit until those other guys come back. Um, Diaz had a good, uh, until the last outing, a good good preseason. Um, and you got the two question marks, uh, Familia and Batances. Man, they got to play. They got to pitch, and they got to be qualities. Uh, uh, you know, Familia can't walk guys in an inning. And Batances got to be around the plate. And even though he's not his speed is not where it was years ago. Um, his breaking pitches and, and, and spot of, of the fastball will be, uh, should be good. But uh, then you got some, you know, you, you got some of the back bullpen um, like May uh, uh, and some of the other guys that'll be ready to go. So I think it all in all, um, they got a little bit lacking defense in center field, but you got the backups, uh, hopefully, with the Mets getting ahead, which they hopefully should, um, in the outfield and at third base. Uh, J.D. Davis, uh, come back to a good year that he had in 2019. And what's good about that, um, I think Chili Davis is back in, in the, on the bench. That will help the hitters. So my impression of the spring training and what they did, they did exactly what they were supposed to do. And um, now we'll, we'll start the season tomorrow and see how it goes from there. Yeah, I agree. It's <clears throat> always um, the one thing you want from preseason is no injuries and that it went about as well as they could have hoped. And apart from Carrasco, but my take on it is they always knew, they knew what they was getting when they brought him in. He does have injury history and the one silver lying in is he won't be out too long. And I just feel what they brought him in for wasn't this stage of the season. It's for the back end. So I guess one way to look at it is where he's recovering from this, then he can't get a serious injury. So that is possibly the silver lining and they could look at. I, I think you're right on that. And uh, with Syndergaard, with, oh, I'm sorry. <laughs> with Syndergaard coming back um, and and in June, you're going to have a situation where um, I, I think you'll have a, a better quality uh, player as, as your second behind DeGrom. And if Stroman is strong uh, as he looks to be, then you got three pretty good guys there, and then you got the fifth, fourth, and fifth starters that you can use. And the other thing again is is injuries, but I think you're right on that 100. percent Yeah, I agree. And another storyline you have going around the Mets, and not just the Mets, the whole league is the Lindor uh, contract negotiation. It's interesting. He's just um, turned down an offer with from what you understand. But my take on it is it'll get done. It's just a question of when um, the Mets really don't have a choice. They brought him in. They need to sign him up long term because I feel like he's possibly the most important player um, in uh, the team at the moment because I feel like he's the player what they want to sort of attract the headlines, if that makes sense. 
It, it sure does. Um, the only thing I, I'm um, with, with this is I'm going on different ends now, but you know, looking at it two different sides. But you know, I, I think when he was in Cleveland, I think he was offered in the excess a little bit of two hundred million dollars uh, for about ten years. And then he gets traded. The Mets made a good deal. I, I honestly think that that's a good deal. It comes to New York, and and he, you know, the first part of negotiation is to set the the bar someplace in New York, and the bar was at a little less than three hundred million dollars for ten years. And then it went on back and forth. And then you know, as negotiation happens, the owner Steve Cohn, um, you know, he looks at and he says four or five days before spring training, here's what I have to offer you, $325 million for 10 years. Now, that's negotiation back and forth. You have a, a you don't have a drop dead thing until tomorrow's spring train, uh, start of the season. But to me, that puts him in the top echelon of quality players at 27 years old, plus the top quality in, in, in money received. Uh, I think it's a little bit deeper than that. Um, it seems like ego comes into play as being the best, the highest paid, greed in some cases a little bit. Uh, the agent has to be looked at a little bit too because that agent wants his person, his play to get the top, which he should, but there's a degree of how high up. And then you got the union pushing a little bit too. And, 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 you know, Cohn's got a lot of money. Everybody says, oh, he's got a lot of money, but he's a business person. And you got to draw a line somewhere. And for $325 million in New York, where, where you know, some of the ads that he might get from other uh, companies and stuff will lead to some income for him. But he'll be in the center stage of, of, uh, of a big city. And I, I hope the discussion comes to that. But you also got to look at, What's going to happen next year with the CBA and, and Major League Baseball in the union? And, and that's setting a tone there as well. So in my opinion, take the money, play the game. If you don't, then you put pressure on your back, on your shoulders. you got to perform now for the years coming up uh, and you don't have a contract. And God forbid you get a Tony Caligliaro ball in the head or an injury to your knees and stuff like that. And that's going to put you maybe behind the eight ball for next year. So the pressure gets on him a little bit. And the New York fans are New York fans. So they know what's going on in his time in, in the area with the pandemic. You know, $325 million is nothing to sneeze at. I don't know if they're going to negotiate one more year. But if you look at the contract, $325 million for the first five years, he might exceed that as far as net worth to the value that he's, he's playing. But on the back end of the contract, when the years come on and the back maybe gets a little bit slower and maybe he doesn't play the defense, he just uses a DH, uh, then the money that he's getting paid for the average that he's averaged out the first five years might be a little less. So it does even out in that sense. So I'm, I'm hoping that, that he signs this contract and you get on to playing baseball and leave it alone for the rest of the year. Yeah, I mean, it's interesting. I look at it mirrors the situation. I know it's a different sport, what we had with the Dallas Cowboys, with Dak Prescott. Um, I think a little bit of a negotiation with Lindor is they're saying, while well, you're in New York, you're uh, on the back end with, in this marketplace much like Jones did with Prescott, but he's saying, well, that's separate. Um, I would look at the Prescott thing. He got an injury. He betted on himself, got the injury. It worked out for him a little bit because he pretty much got what he wanted, but mm -hmm. it is a dangerous game. Um, I think it will get done. Um it's just one of those things that pretty much gave him what he said he wanted and he sort of moved the goalposts a little. So um, it's always when you start doing that, well, owners don't like to be told what to do. Mm -hmm. Being rich men in their business life, 
let's be honest, they tell people what to do. So you never can discount ego coming in and saying, right. no, you won't tell me what to do. And then it turning nasty. So I don't think that will happen, but you never know because um, obviously when ego comes in, it throws everything into jeopardy. So we shall see. And it'll certainly be, interesting to watch and it'll be a storyline to watch over the coming weeks yeah I, I think so and the more time that goes on unfortunately if you put on a negative first unfortunately here um they don't sign a contract and he does get off to a rough start um you know the ten thousand people at the stadium or so will find will sound like fifty thousand people booing him and the same the the thing is reversed too. You know, he hits the ball. He's not signed, but he's hitting the, the, the heck out of the baseball and, and, and leadership that he that he has. Then there's gonna be a little pressure on management to say, come on, let's do something here. Add the error too, you know, negotiate a little bit more. So it, it's gonna have a give and take, like you said, Dan. And uh the sorry side is if it doesn't get done. Um, but hopefully it will. So we'll leave it like that. But I'm um, I'm for him, my opinion. Please sign the contract, please. Yeah, I agree. It's interesting because the next thing I was going to talk to you about is the sort of battle for New York between them and the Yankees. Sort of, I feel like this year it's going to be very interesting because it's always been the Yankees on the back page, and I don't think they want to give that up. But I think there is a chance the Mets could steal their thunder a little bit. And Lindor's very important to that because he's the sort of what you call the jazzy player. If um, he'll be key to that. So that's some of where he's got them, where he wants them because um, he's got that star power. And it'll be interesting how the New York... Um, the heart of New York goes, what sides on top. Um, and yep. obviously, um, it's I find it always interesting because um, the New York faithful always stays true to the Yankees. But you don't know. Um, I think the Mets are building something. And it'll be interesting to see um, how the popularity um, sort of flows as the season progresses. Yeah, I, I think too is that, you know, New York is a baseball town. Uh, me growing up in Queens, New York, and being a Brooklyn Dodger fan and then switching over to the Mets in 1962, we, but we would go to Yankee Stadium. I, 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 as teenagers, we would see Sunday double headers. We would, after the game was over, we walk on the field and get out through center field. Um, you know, but I, I think you have to look at it going to Shea Stadium, uh, skipping school, um, and 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 then taking off from work a little bit in the afternoon, coming over to Shea for the opening of the season, seeing the the the, the rise and fall of, of both of these teams, and where one is. One, the Yankees are in the top of the newspaper ads on the back of the pages, you said, and then the Mets slowly getting in for a year and leaving. So I think it's going to be great this year for New York baseball. You're going to have a lot of competition between the Mets fans and the Yankee fans, which is great. And uh, But you're going to have some competition between the players. You're going to have Judge and maybe Alonzo for home runs. You're going to have pitches pitching like Cole and, and DeGrom back and forth, who's winning games and stuff. You're going to have seen quality baseball plays that can hit the opposite fields, hit home runs between LeMayo and Lindor. Uh, you got both uh, Med pens and the Yankee pens, a little question mark and everything, but you do have quality closes in Chapman and Diaz. There's, there's always hope for the back and forth. And then what's really cool is that 
in both the TV announcers and the radio announcers for both sides. You have the Met fans thinking about Keith and, and, and Gary Cohn and Ron Darling and, and Howie Rose uh, on the Mets side. And, and you got Susan and, uh, you know, and all those guys there. And you got the radio people for Susan and, and uh, Wallman. And then you got the, ra- uh, the TV guys. So it, it, it's great to, to listen to, to all of these um, radio and TV guys do their thing. But it's, it's nice to hear that in New York sports. The only thing we're worried about, I think, between both teams now, unfortunately, is uh, some battles of injuries. So, uh, you, you know, between Judge and Stanton, uh, you got Sanchez behind the plate. Uh, hopefully he'll have a good year. And, and he'll be able to, to come back after a tough year last year. But you don't want these guys to get injured. You don't want Alonso to get injured or, you know, guys like uh, Michael Conforto uh, here in his Brooklyn Cyclones uniform. Uh, and you, you, you want these guys to hit the baseball. You need Dominic Smith and not only to play good defense in, in the outfield, but really come through uh, to back up Alonso at first base. So you're going to have a wonderful year of, of New York baseball and, and the back and forth between the fans and the players and um, everything. So it'll be a good year. And I expect the Yankees probably to win close to 100 games and maybe the Mets uh, to come up close to them, but not quite, and win between 90 and 93 games. Um, that's what I feel. And both teams should be in the playoffs. And I'm not going to even say World Series. All right. But it would be great in New York City. Yeah, it would. And um, this is just to finish up, but sort of connected to this, I think, and I've said on a few of my streams, that um, in the tough year what we've had, New York sport is interesting. You can argue they're in sort of the brightest uh, spot in all the sports that you have had for, uh, obviously, we've talked about the baseball, but the Jets and the Giants, the Knicks, and obviously the Nets, they're all sort of not necessarily at the top of um, the standings, but I think they're all being run by competent people and the future looks bright, even with the Giants and the Jets. I think they're heading in the same path, on the right path. So I think that is good for New York and it could be interesting because as I've said before, I feel like if the sports teams are doing well, that might help the money flow across New York, which obviously will help the economy grow as we open the world back up. Yep, and I agree. And the, the Islanders are going to open up a new arena in Belmont Park next year. And the Rangers always come into the garden and you'll see Rod Gilbert there once in a while. Or go into the Nassau Coliseum, you might see Bobby Nystrom and uh, Clark Gillies. And, and they have such a relationship with the fans. And what was nice about growing up in New York, and I know there's other towns, you got Boston, you got Chicago, you know, you got L.A. And you have these wonderful towns where people support their their teams and but in New York um, the passion that's there with the multitude of sports uh, brings a lot of life back and hopefully this will continue as we move forward this year um, with the vaccines and people coming into the stands uh, as you know I work for the Tri-City Valley Cats which is now an independent baseball league in the Frontier League and we look to have fans come back we have a 4,500 seat stadium so you know, we, we hope to get all of the people back, but if it's 50% or 30% in the beginning, you're going to see the friendships and, and the neighborhood boys talking to each other and the ladies about baseball or hockey or whatever it might be. So, Dan, I think that's wonderful. Yeah, it sure is. Yeah, I agree. I mean, um, one thing what I know a lot of New York fans want is Obviously, there's nothing like going to Madison Square Garden, whether it's hockey or basketball. And um, I think that's what 
when you think of New York, that's one of the token things if you're just talking, even just tourists going to Madison Square Garden. So I think um, people will go back. I think, um, as you've seen, with the limited capacity they are allowed, they sell the allocations. Uh, and I think they'll only be um, positive for New York because people talk about um, obviously what it does to some of the clubs but when you think about the um, little businesses like offenders um, yep. this people don't realise that people make the argument oh these are millionaires but it's not just them what depend on something like the NBA it's the smaller guy and if there's no capacity there's nothing to get paid for so the people don't realize how much sport it touches lots of little industries what isn't necessary on a spreadsheet so i think that's important to remember what sport does for these people you just take about the outside of Madison Square Garden, all those little shops and things like that. And you talk about Madison Square Garden, the inside. I just want to, I know our time is short, but, you know, they talk about the Willis Reed game and him coming out against the playoffs in 1970 against the Los Angeles Lakers with a bad leg and stuff. But there was one thing that touched my heart because I grew up with this guy. His name was Eddie Jockerman. And Eddie Jockerman was, was, really uh, the, the face of the New York Island, uh, New York Rangers. And uh, John Davidson was a, coming up as a goaltender and they let Jockerman go on waivers and the Detroit Red Wings picked them up four days before the Detroit Red Wings were coming into Madison Square Garden. And Dan, this was, you, you people can look this up, just look up the Eddie Eddie game at Madison Square Garden. Because when he came out for practice, the Madison Square Garden turned to Detroit and they started to yell, Eddie, Eddie, Eddie. When the national anthem was being sung prior to the game, you couldn't hear it because everybody was yelling, Eddie, Eddie. So much so that he started to cry. And the game was like being played in Detroit and the Red Wings won. That's some of the passion of, of people, of the fans of New York that make a difference in an athlete's life in the city here. And I hope Lindor picks up on that because you're gonna see that not only this year, but from past years in the history of the New York sports fan. So just wanted to mention that. It just, I was at that game and I'll never forget it. Yep. And um, I think that's why everyone loves new york and also i think that's the perfect place to end the episode on a sort of positive note as that's how i like to but i'd like to thank you for coming along and i'm looking forward and thank to you very the much next yeah no well, we'll talk but... soon yep and thank you so much for allowing me to come on your program here talking sports and to the people out there uh, stay well, and my best to everybody. And see you on down the road. Yours in sports forever. Thanks, Dan. Yeah, thank you. And until next time, let's talk sports, thanks.